This podcast was recorded at 9 a.m. on 24 May Jakarta time. Things may have changed by the time you hear this. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Reformasi Dispatch. I'm Jeff Hutton, regional correspondent for the Straits Times of Singapore. And I am Kevin O'Rourke, writer and producer of the Reformasi Weekly Service on Indonesian politics and policymaking. Kevin, welcome back. We were off last week for Lebaran. Yeah, that was a long break, and uh, now there's just a pile of news to talk about. It has it has avalanched on us. Can we see that? Can you see avalanche? Absolutely. Yes. Know. Yes. Well, we can't hear. It's mon- Monday morning. Um, well, in the news, we have poo on poo pooing ganjar. Uh, we have <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have um, uh, coal gasification, um, carbon sequestration, and after the break, we speak at length with former U.S. Ambassador Robert Blake, who was sounding very upbeat about Indonesian potential to reduce carbon emissions and renewed U.S. climate leadership, as well as Indonesia's economic outlook. And there's also a tax bomb, so a uh, new policy announced by the uh, Coordinating Economics Minister about uh, a bill to change a whole lot of things about taxation. So complete with a carbon tax, which um, is to be believed when seen. But anyway, we'll get to that in a second. (laughs) <laughs> First, talk to us about COVID because uh, it's it's kind of like this uneasy calm before the storm, maybe. Or yeah. is there signs of optimism? Do we have reason to think we may have dodged a bullet? Uh, no, this is the uh, the tenterhooks period where uh, uh, every day the uh, case infection data is uh, crucial because. Past history shows spikes following holidays, and last week was a giant holiday, Eid al-Fitri. Um, what's interesting is that the um, seven-day moving average of case detections is flat relative to um, two weeks ago before the holiday. So as of 23 May, the uh, cases detected were still just over 5,000 a day nationwide, which is uh yeah, not too bad, all things considered, and it's about where it had been before uh, the holidays. And there's a period of uh, uh, three days running where that number did not increase, really. Um, so, but it's still early days. I mean, you look at the incubation uh, period of the um, virus, and uh, yeah, <clears throat> it, it it could very well spike in the, in the next few days. That's why this is a, a crucial period. There's very little reason for it not to spike, right? I mean, we there was more or less a mass ex. I, I live in Jakarta, and I can tell you the streets were empty, and now they're not. Things are full. People went away. Right. There's every reason to think that if 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 they dodged a bullet, as as I say again, uh, it's uh, it's purely by luck. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, this virus acts in mysterious ways. So uh, who knows if there's something to do with uh, you know, the weather conditions or what. But um, you know, there are the new variants out there and they are more contagious. So you would think that there will be a pretty nasty spike in the, in the days and weeks ahead unless unless the compensating factor is just uh, greater public awareness and the, uh, the mask wearing and social distancing and screening that that the authorities did try to put in place. Um, so. Did you see that um, there was a cluster, uh, COVID uh, infection cluster among medical workers in central Java? They were treating infected Filipino crew members of a, of a cargo ship. And I think the troubling bit here is that presumably they, those medical workers would have been immunized against it, but they still got sick. I don't know how sick, but they still got infected. Yeah, um, you know, uh, yeah, I think in a situation like that where, you know, potentially uh, these uh, healthcare workers were really surrounded by massive quantities of uh, viral particles and uh, aerosols in, in the in the room, they could be bombarded with it. And uh, you, you it, naturally, there would be a breakthrough infection there. Uh, so um, yeah, ideally, the vaccine is sufficient to prevent the people from uh, going to hospital or dying. Uh, but uh yeah, breakthrough infections do you know, can and do occur, so that's going to be sort of a uh, a feature going forward. Now, as more people get uh, vaccinated, you will still see infections among vaccinated people. But the key is that they should not be getting as sick or, or dying. That's right. I mean, 
um, we're starting to see sort of the the uh, the language around this switching from preventing infections to um, watching out how sick the infected get, and that you could still get infected. It's a question of whether that manifests into symptoms or anything requiring medical attention and a, or a bed. And that seems to be on the way, at least in rich countries that are rolling out vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is how vaccines always work for other diseases, other vaccines in, in history. Um, very rarely is there a vaccine which is always 100% effective. It's usually uh, you know, 70, 80, 90%. Okay, a bolt out of the blue. Puan has gone to Central Java, and she has seemingly snubbed Central Java Governor Ganjar Pranowo, who has been a leading candidate if uh, approval ratings, uh, opinion polls are to be believed. What's happening here? Puan, of course, is the daughter of former president and PDIP chair Megawati Sukarnaputri, and the the hope of the uh, Sukarno clan. Mm -hmm. Well... Uh, Reformasi Dispatch listeners will be well aware that uh, you know, one of the political issues is uh, Ganjar getting the backing that he needs from PDIP and the tensions there with Megawati being potentially jealous of his popularity. And uh, that indeed does seem to be playing out. Uh, just uh, you know, just uh, two days ago, uh, Puan Maharani visited uh, PDIP cadres in, CD in Central Java and uh, pointedly did not invite Ganjar, who's... Uh, a PDIP figure who's the governor of that province. Uh, so it, clearly now there's a uh, an open rivalry between uh, Puan and Ganjar, and also uh, Puan's supporters have been bad mouthing Ganjar, basically uh, complaining that he's so active on social media and he has so many social media followers, uh, as if that's a bad thing. <laughs> uh, so um, this is disturbing. This is problematic. It it, it uh, suggests that. Uh, Megawati and the PDIP leadership may be intent on matching Puan with Prabowo of uh, Garindra on a ticket with Puan as the running mate. And um, and if that were to happen, then uh, it would remain to be seen whether a couple other parties would then pick uh, Ganjar uh, to be their nominee. And that could be Golkar and uh, Nasdem. What do you think is is the um, incentive for all this? To just I mean, because Puan has about as much chance of becoming president as I do, or vice president for that matter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, most polls uh, show her somewhere in between the uh, zero to one percent support level. So somewhere in that range of zero to one. Uh, so yeah, it's just, uh, I think the, the, there's a difference between um, what's good for the country on one hand and what's good for um the Sukarno family on the other. So apparently they're very uncomfortable with having nominated Joko Widodo, who does not always do their bidding as president. And they probably fear that that would happen again under a Ganjar presidency. So they're willing, therefore, to uh, forsake that opportunity of nominating the winner again and instead um, joining with Prabowo in order for Puan to to move one step up the ranks uh, from parliament speaker currently to vice president uh, with the expectation then that uh, 10 years hence she would have the chance to become president, which is also a big assumption. I mean, that, among other things, it assumes that after Prabowo becomes president, there would be another presidential election. <laughs> that could very well be the, the last one that Indonesia sees, unfortunately, because his uh, credentials are not strong in that department. There's not exactly a, a leading light in democratic circles. What's the relationship like between Ibu Mega and, um, and, and Prabowo? Right. Well, they ran together in the past. Uh, 2009, Prabowo was her running mate in that election uh, that uh, Yudiono won. Uh, they uh, performed uh, better than Wiranto anyway that year. But um, th there's been tensions at time uh, in the 2012 election election. Uh, there was a, a falling out basically between them uh, in the uh, 2012 Jakarta governor's election. But I think uh, if their respective self-interests are at stake, they can patch over their differences. Well, wait a minute. The 2012 election was when um, Jokowi and Ahok were, were running. And who was uh, Mega's horse in that race? 
Uh, yeah, well, so the uh, Ahok was uh, Prabowo's nominee. Um, Ahok was the Garindra addition to that ticket. And I think the expectation was that Prabowo's brother Hashim Jojo Hadikusumo would be supplying all the money needed for the campaign financing. And in fact, they supplied very little, if any. And so there were some hard feelings. I, I just, I just find it so funny because the question that we that uh, we were positing uh, in a previous edition of uh, the pod was, you know, will will Ganjar get the support that he needs? Yeah. <laughs> the answer was an emphatic no. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, anything else uh, shaking out of the horse race? Um, it, it doesn't. This isn't necessarily a death blow to Gunter. Um, hopes, right? Um, well, I will. Okay, so here's another scenario: is that the uh, like we talked about in the past, the whole thing right now with Ganjar is that he needs attention and notoriety and headlines in the press. And uh, what gets more headlines than a dogfight? So if there is indeed a big nasty fight brewing between uh, Puan and Ganjar, that could actually help Ganjar a lot because it'll make people sit up and take notice of what's going on. Um, so oh my it, God, you're right. It's like it's like an Indonesian drama. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> those Indonesian dramas you see on on um, TVRE. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's see. Telenovela. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Drama. All right. Well, what? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, tax news. Big yeah. news. Uh, and possibly another tax amnesty. Another one? Another right. so- yeah. yeah uh, the coordinating minister came out sort of out of the blue with uh, some very kind of brief, uh, brief and rather cryptic comments about a plan to put forth a revision of the 2009 law on general tax rules and procedures. So, This is one of the three bedrock tax laws, and uh, it's kind of surprising that they're going ahead with this because the jobs omnibus last year already featured a few big tax changes regarding dividends and especially a corporate tax cut. Uh, And yet finance ministry have been talking about doing a uh, or or is uh, trying to do a financial sector reform omnibus bill this year. And now on top of everything else, they're they're announcing this uh, General tax law revision, and Hartarto said that it's going to touch on a uh, change to VAT. It's going to introduce a GST, uh, goods and services tax, like a sales tax for the consumer, uh, a possible tax amnesty, and a carbon tax. Some of those things are good and some are bad. I mean, a carbon tax, I think, would be great. Uh, There's going to be a lot of resistance to it, given the power of the coal mining lobby. But Hartarto is a small-scale tycoon himself and represents Gold Car, which has a lot of coal interests, and yet he's the one proposing this. So that, that in and of itself is a good sign right there. Um, and then um, you know, GST tax is controversial because that's uh, something that could burden consumers. All these things depend on, on the details of the implementation. Uh, a VAT revision is probably a good thing. You know, a slight upward revision to the VAT is would help the government uh, get the added revenue that it sorely needs right now. The tax ratio that Indonesia has is extremely low. It's very hard for a developing country to develop with a, a tax ratio as low as Indonesia's right now, which is around 11% or so, I think. Um, so, the, the, But the real controversial thing is the tax amnesty, because there, there already was one in 2016, 2017. And basically, people who had been avoiding or uh, evading tax uh, in the past were able to suddenly declare their wealth in exchange for a uh, 2% redemption fee, and their past uh, evasion would therefore be forgiven. So that needed to be, should have been a a -a once-in-a-lifetime event, and now already five years later they're talking about doing it again. (laughs) So it it would make nobody ever want to pay tax again because you (laughs) you just wait around for the next amnesty when you get to pay 2% instead of 30%. Yeah, yeah. Is there, I, I, I guess I could sort of see their thinking that um, it didn't pack quite the punch. So maybe they could roll out another one in a more limited fashion. That yeah. you know, if you, but still, it would have to reward good behavior, wouldn't it? Yeah. The key is that the second tax amnesty, if they go ahead with it, would have to apply only to those who did not take part in the first one. So if you were able to benefit from a tax amnesty twice in five years, that's that's just preposterous. 
So, um, yeah, yeah, so all, all these things that Artarto brought up, it really depends on the details that are going to come out later. It really illustrates the, uh, the, the squeeze that the government finds itself in. They, they, they're we're sort of maneuvering for a fiscal room, right? Right. So yeah, there, there's a, there's a dire need for revenue right now because there's all sorts of spending priorities. Um, and the president is still talking about moving the national capital for that matter as well. So yeah, and you know, revenues are, are down this year. Um, uh, but nonetheless, the problem is, is really uh, collection. Uh, it's not necessarily a problem with what's written in the tax statutes. So to go back and rewrite the tax statutes is arguably the, the wrong solution to the problem because no matter what's written in the statute, it's, you, the collections are never going to happen if uh, personnel in the uh, uh, Director General of Taxation uh, uh, continue to suffer uh, investigations for corruption, as happened just uh, uh, two months ago. The, the key figure, the Director for Tax Extensification, became a KPK suspect uh, in, a, in a case involving uh, you know, the uh, Haji Isam, the, uh, the uh, notorious uh, coal miner in South Kalimantan. So more reliable, more consistent enforcement of existing laws would, is sort of low-hanging fruit. Um, uh, what about this carbon tax? Uh, that, that sounds really uh, progressive thinking. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's big news. I mean, that's something that uh, really has not uh, received any high level of discussion that I'm aware of from policymakers in public. So uh, and it's exactly what Indonesia needs, as anybody who has ever ever tried to breathe in Jakarta would, is readily aware <laughs> the, the smog from all the, the dirty coal being burned in the power plants and the cement factories all around Jakarta is uh, is, is out of control. So, um and mm. Indonesia has uh, emissions uh, targets that it needs to start working towards. And so a uh, carbon tax would, would would really make a big impact. Uh, and it's possible to direct the, the income to uh, alleviate uh, electricity bills for consumers. Uh, you know, so there are, there are ways to make it work that way. I have a crazy idea. Tax cigarettes more. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's... I don't know what pack of cigarettes goes for now, but it's, it can't be very much. Yeah, no, the uh, they have you know the tax increases are not uh, big enough on cigarettes for sure. Hey everybody, this is Kevin O'Rourke here. Uh, I want to tell you about the Reformasi Weekly Service on Indonesian politics and policy making. If you haven't uh, checked it out, go ahead and sign up for a free trial. There's a button to do so on reformasi.info, my website. You may very well like it. If you like the podcast, uh, you're probably going to like the report. Uh, the only difference is that you'll have to actually actively read it instead of just listening to it. Uh, we've got all sorts of subscribers, uh, major embassies, donors, banks, uh, resource companies, uh, NGOs, journalists, universities and uh, individuals who are like uh, retirees or students, uh, yeah, uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, reach out, get in touch, and uh, there are discounts that are available depending on your category. And it's a, it's a unique resource, I can say that. Uh, there are some copycat uh, products out there now, but uh, I would recommend that you go with the original. Talking about carbon, uh, there's a carbon sequestration uh, project um, that caught your eye. Uh, it's not, well, the project caught your eye because it will use carbon sequestration. It's actually a gas, a coal gasification project uh, aimed at uh, uh, substituting imports of LPG um, for cooking gas with coal gas. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, you've summed it up very well. This is what I would yeah. say is Indonesia's most complicated project ever. It does seem uh, securitous. securitous. Right. So <laughs> basically, and uh, you know, what, what I also found interesting about this is that right now there's so much uh, discussion of the grab SPAC and there's a you know, $40 billion valuation for this uh, ride hailing company that uh, is a super app. And uh, all the attention is focused on the digital economy. And yet, there's a real problem out there, uh, unresolved, which is uh, how to make cooking fuel affordable for an average family. That's a huge problem in Indonesia. 
Yeah, electricity is, is not a possibility for families. Uh, natural gas pipelines uh, that, that are available in developed countries uh, don't exist. That's still a long way off in Indonesia. You know, firewood and, and charcoal are terrible alternatives. So uh, for years under Suharto, Indonesia had uh, provided kerosene. And then uh, 15 years ago, there was a switch made that was a, a good switch to uh, LPG. And so that's the cooking fuel that's used ubiquitous. About 70% of houses use it. It's ubiquitous. Um, but it's um, most of it, uh, three quarters of it is imported and the price has gone up. And the subsidy that the government spends is huge. Uh, about three quarters of the price is subsidized. So the idea here is to take dirty coal from a state coal company, PT Tambang Batubara Bukadasam, and convert it into uh, syngas, and then convert the syngas into dimethyl ether, which can be used as a cooking fuel, as a substitute for LPG. So that's the idea. And uh, the the uh, problem is that when you do that, a couple things. One, the, the DME ends up costing more than the imported LPG. Yeah. So it doesn't save you any money in terms of government subsidies, but uh, it does substitute an import. So it, it saves some foreign exchange. Uh, it helps the uh, current account balance. It's incredibly dirty. It's got to be. Yeah, that's the other problem is that it. Uh, there's an NGO, uh, the AEER, the domestic NGO that calculated that this... Uh, uh, DME or dimethyl ether will have five times the greenhouse gas emissions of combusting LPG. So that's where the uh, CCUS comes in because there weren't enough acronyms to begin with. So uh, this is a carbon capture utilization and storage and ExxonMobil is going to be providing this. And this is going to be uh, Exxon's, uh, probably Exxon's biggest for a overseas outside of the U.S. in uh, carbon capture, if it goes to plan. Um, and uh, uh, here, this is controversial too, though, because they're, they're not capturing the, uh, the CO2 coming off the, uh, the DME production and putting it into the ground and leaving it at that. Instead, what they're, what they're doing is capturing that CO2 and using it for EOR. It's another acronym for you, Enhanced Oil Recovery in uh, Pertamina's oil fields. So they're going to use it to inject into the oil reservoirs to, to push out basically uh, more crude oil so that then we can burn more crude oil and create more carbon. And it's, <laughs> it's a circular economy. <laughs> hey, why not just try to produce more LPG? Oh, well, you can't. Indonesia just doesn't have the resource. Um, you, you have to, only the, the really massive oil producers uh, produce enough LPG, so they have to import it from the Middle East. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, so moving on. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just in here trying to sort of uh, to plot out my org chart here. <laughs> Let me see. B N E C E O R. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, the other funny thing is that uh, so the the people at uh, 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 PTBA, the the state coal company that's in partnership with Pertamina and the U.S. company called Air Products. Uh, PTBA came out and said, um, you know, because we have so many coal to gasification projects and they're so expensive to do, uh, we have to uh, you know, have more money on hand to pay for these expensive projects. So therefore, we're going to uh, expand our coal mining capacity and produce more coal and sell more coal in order to pay for the coal to get coal gasification. And it defeats the purpose of uh, you know, uh, processing coal if you have to produce more coal in order to pay for the downstream coal processing. A little bit of a whiplash there after a previous conversation about carbon tax. I can't imagine how profitable this this might be. Yeah, if that carbon tax is brought in. Uh, speaking of uh, climate and uh, clean up our act, we're moving on to uh, former U.S. ambassador to Indonesia, Robert Blake. Our interview with him and uh, his views on what he seems to think Indonesia has a improving climate outlook. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we talked with uh, Ambassador Blake about uh, Indonesia's uh, progress in reducing de deforestation rates in, over the past five years. Uh, and then uh, we also went on to uh, talk about the economy uh, with him and uh, Indonesia's outlook for coming out of the pandemic and uh, you know, charting a bit of a recovery. He was, he was very enthusiastic and he sounded a little bit like a guy who, um, I don't know, is, do you think he's completely out of government or is... Has he found a more lucrative uh, job in, on 
as, as a consultant. Uh, I think he's got a lot to offer. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, still, still a lot of appointments to be made in D.C. All right. Here's Robert Blake. His career spanned 31 years in the U.S. State Department before becoming ambassador to the Maldives and Sri Lanka and then ambassador to Indonesia from January 2014 to July 2016. Robert Blake, thanks for taking some time to talk with us. I'm delighted to be with you guys. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks so much, sir. You, you popped up on our radar because you wrote an op-ed last month in the Jakarta Post that um, I'm going to tell you, it shocked me. I was stunned because uh, it was borderline good news. Because, <laughs> you know, we got so little of it. Um, but uh, more lately, but still. Um, you, you, you pointed out in the op-ed in, in the Jakarta Post um, that the rates of deforestation have fallen in, in Indonesia for uh, four straight years, not so in, in other parts of the world, but Indonesia is doing quite well. Forest cover uh, loss to fire is about a tenth of what it was in the bad old days in 2015. You'll remember that during the, the worst fires uh, that Indonesia saw since the late 90s. And you, you, you rightly credit, in my view, uh, the moratorium on clearing primary forests and um, the moratorium on clearing land for, for oil palm. Um, how is this track record being viewed from where you are in, in DC? Uh, well, you, you're working in DC. Um, and I'm curious what, why you felt the need to put pen to paper to point it out. Well, um, first of all, thanks for asking, because I don't think this gets enough attention in general, what's going on in Indonesia. And I think, you know, there has been progress. I think Indonesia has been under the gun for a long time. And I think it's important to recognize progress when it does occur. And to be sure, there's still work that needs to be done. but. Um, as you say, I think the, the, the steps that President Jokowi has ordered, the, the moratorium on the clearing of, of both forests and peatland, and as well as the moratorium on new oil palm licenses, those are, have really had an effect. And, and we've seen that as well as, as this really important uh, progress on, on the fires. As you say, in 2015, when I was there, uh, they were estimating that the greenhouse gases that were being emitted as a result of the fires in Sumatra and Kalimantan were the equivalent of Germany's yearly greenhouse gas emissions. So it gives you a sense of the, of the scale of what was happening there. And uh, so the fact that they've been able to bring those down by 90%, I think is important. And they are making an effort on the enforcement side. And also, I think there's, there's, uh, private efforts underway. Uh, you know, a lot of the big forest companies are, are putting in place incentive programs to encourage the villages uh, on the borders of these big areas to, uh, to put out fires. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's had an impact as well. So what's your involvement then since you, you left the, the State Department? You're, you're with McClarty Associates. What's, um, what's, what's your involvement? How, how are you... Uh... So I, I kind of do, I have kind of two different things. As you say, uh, with McClarty Associates, I, I, I really, ch I had the Southeast Asia program. Um, and I really, our, our job is to hopefully bring, help bring new business to, to the region, but also in some cases to help uh, some of the, the companies in Indonesia, um, maybe to go and seize opportunities elsewhere. So for example, one of, one of the interesting work that I'm doing right now is uh, I'm advising the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. Um, as, as you guys may remember, when I was ambassador, I worked a lot on sustainable palm oil, and we um, fashioned a, an initiative with uh, a lot of the big palm oil companies to get them to agree to stop clearing primary forests and, and, and peatland, and to, uh, to the extent that there would be new planning would only be on previously degraded land. And, you know, I learned a lot from that mm -hmm. experience. And so it was kind of a natural segue to then work with RSPO, which is uh, probably the top certification mechanism that exists in the world now. And so we're helping them to kind of uh, build up a little bit their government relations function, because 
they're not very good communicators. They, they do a lot of great work, but it's not necessarily widely known. And we also want to help them uh, position themselves for the very, very important meetings uh, that will take place, uh, the COP26 meetings in Glasgow in November. So that's the kind of work we do. And then I also work on a pro bono basis for a lot of the big environmental groups. So the World Resources Institute, which uh, runs, among other things, Global Forest Watch, this great satellite monitoring mechanism, but also groups like the World Wildlife Fund and, and, uh, and so forth. And mostly I help them in Indonesia in one way or another. And I've also been in touch with the Kerry team about uh, advising them on working with the Indonesian government now as they prepare their nationally determined contribution. Are you working with John Kerry, the former? Uh, the, 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 the former yeah, I mean, exactly. I'm very informally. I'm not an official advisor or anything like that. I All just, right. He's, he's, he's not sending you WhatsApp messages. No, no, he's not. <laughs> can you, uh, but uh, can you uh, give us any insights into uh, what they're thinking uh, with regards to Indonesia? Well, Indonesia is one of, a, of about 20 countries or so uh, with whom they have set up uh, basically a, a bilateral task force to work through how uh, the U.S. can help uh, these 20 countries that represent some 80 percent of, of global greenhouse gas emissions, how they can help them to uh, raise their ambition uh, of, their, of their nationally determined contribution and further reduce their emissions pledges for what they hope to achieve by 2030. So, uh, so they're, they're, they're engaged in a very, very detailed process now, uh, chaired by Minister Lahut, the famous uh, coordinating minister, uh, and Kerry on, on, on the US side. And then the people who are doing the day-to-day -day work are, are just one level below that, and sort of Deputy Foreign Minister Mahindra Siragar, who is a former uh, ambassador here, uh, a very capable guy. Um, and then uh, Deputy Minister of Environment and Forest, Ibu Nani. So they're, you know, they're, they've got a very, very detailed work plan that they're working through. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged. I think there's going to be some, some real progress here. And I think the U.S. is kind of leading the way in, um, in helping Indonesia to think through what more they can do. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, if, if you had told me in 2015 that I would hear of senior representative of PLN, the, their um, power company, um, say that net zero emissions in 2050 are possible with innovation and finance, I probably would have fallen off my chair. But yet that's what they're talking about now. So I think it's, there's just a huge change in, in mentality and a huge change in understanding what the opportunities are in Indonesia. Now, to be fair, they've got still some serious challenges. The, probably the most serious one is how, how are they going to wean themselves off coal, since that still accounts for a large percentage of their greenhouse gas emissions. But again, the group is working on that. And, you know, the market is speaking. Um, we've seen that the, the Koreans and the Japanese, for example, who have been major sources of finance for Indonesian coal, uh, have announced that they're no longer going to be providing financial support for overseas coal projects. And even China. China, as, as you recall, during the, the Leaders' Summit on Climate that was hosted by Biden in April, they said that they would limit their increase in coal consumption and then, uh, you know, gradually phase it down. So so even there, I think we're, we're going to see progress. So, so the writing is on the wall for the Indonesians and other big coal producers. And so it's smart that they're now thinking how to accelerate their transition towards cleaner cleaner energy okay yeah i think um yeah this is interesting because there's certainly a lot of apprehension on this point uh, considering the institutional interest at stake yeah and the, the coal sector is represented in the cabinet the Luhut himself owns coal mines uh and then the, the new designated ambassador to the u.s uh rosan roslani is a coal mining executive as well absolutely uh, yeah and again, I'm not saying that coal is going to be phased out tomorrow. It's good. They're going to, there's going to be a, a plan. But nonetheless, the fact that they're now talking about this in a serious way and talking about um, ramping up the acceleration to clean energy, I think, is very, very important and can really make a difference. Right. Yeah. And I think Indonesia's targets call for assistance. Uh, yeah. They, yeah. 
you know, they, as you know, they, Kerry they, is working very, very hard with, you know, the both the, the multilateral development banks, but also the private sources of finance to uh, to gear up various sources of, of climate finance to to help with this uh, with this transition. So, so again, I think there's there's a lot of very, very serious work going on now, and I think the fact that John Kerry himself is involved in this because he's so knowledgeable and experienced is is very promising. But do you see uh, Indonesia getting fairly quickly to a point where they are they are they will phase out coal fired power plants? I, th I think they will. I mean, I, I don't I don't want to put a date on it because that's that's what's under discussion now. But again, I think there's just uh, there are market forces at work here in addition to the hmm. the power persuasion of of John Kerry and his team uh, right. that are going to that are going to force the Indonesians into to, to do that. That's, that's probably a little ways in the future. What do you think some of the low-hanging fruit are now, um, given the, the sunk costs and all, all these coal-fired power plants have been, have been going up? I think the low-hanging fruit is just expanding um, renewables, so both uh, solar and wind. Um, you know, I when I was ambassador, we inaugurated a huge um, uh, wind farm in Sulawesi, in South Sulawesi, which was the first utility-scale um wind farm in Indonesia. And I think there's there's a lot more opportunities there, but also solar. I mean, as you know, the cost of solar is now below the cost of, of most fossil fuels. And so there's an enormous opportunity to scale that up. And I think, again, the embassy, the U.S. embassy and others are, are thinking through now how we can uh, get American companies more involved in, in, in this. And they're thinking through various kinds of incentives. So, for example, the, the Development Finance Corporation, which is this uh, new corporation that was set up by, by Donald Trump, you know, they, they've now talked about um, setting up various various new um, climate-related programs. So they they themselves have pledged that that DFC is going to reach itself net zero emissions in its investments by 2040. They're going to increase climate-focused investments. To about a third of new investments by 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 next year, so you know they're 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 talking a very big big game here. And then likewise, the export import bank, they announced in the last days of the Trump administration a big new program, a seven hundred and fifty million dollar trade financing program. And under that, you know, clean energy is certainly going to be one of the one of the big opportunities. So so I think you're going to see both the finance available. But also uh, Indonesia taking steps to make it easier to to invest in areas because you know there's there's long been kind of difficulties working with PLN and so forth. So again, I, I hope we're going to see um, it, it, the, the the government, the Indonesian government, uh, make it easier for for foreign investors to to come in and and as you know, Indonesia because it has this. These far-flung six thousand inhabited islands, and they don't have a central grid on any of them. Those are just perfect opportunities to set up small-scale um, solar slash wind with batteries, uh, and and really enable um, economic development in, in in a lot of these um, a lot of these islands. So yeah, the so technology I, I, I is, is perfect for it. It is. It is. So. Um, so I just I just hope that that's and I do believe that is going to be a real priority. And uh, do you, how do you see uh, REDD plus uh, fitting into this, especially from the U.S. Uh, perspective, the avoided uh, deforestation scheme? Yeah, as you know, there, there's been some some friction between the Norwegians and the and the uh, Indonesians on Red Plus and the and the whole payments system. You know, I hope they can they can resolve that. Um, there, it's been a little bit tricky. Um, so, I, I, you know, I hope we can get beyond that. I think there there are now new opportunities that are that are coming up. So, one one of the interesting ones is um, something called the Leaf program. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's, Leaf stands for lowering emissions by accelerating forest finance. Basically, the, the F part is left out. Yeah, this was a focus of the Economist editorial uh, last week. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And basically, for your for your listeners, 
This would be a program under which um, companies would pay basically an amount equal to about $10 a ton for avoided carbon dioxide emissions. So basically, if, if companies or let's say a, a, a forest company agrees to keep trees in the ground, they would be compensated for that. Uh, and then it, and if it's a country that owns, uh, let's say, a, a given area, uh, and it's, let's say, you know, a state land of some sort, they would also be paid. Now, the, the catch would be that th these, these would only be paid out after showing, um, you know, five years of progress. Um, so there, there is there are some some serious benchmarks, but nonetheless, these are the kind of innovative financing schemes that are coming online now. And uh, you know, again, Indonesia with its vast forest holdings really stands to benefit from that. So I, I we've pitched that to the Indonesians, and I hope they're going to take advantage of it. When you when you uh, uh, engage with Indonesia, do you perceive these gains on? Uh avoided deforestation or, or the, the reduced rate of deforestation in Indonesia as being uh, somewhat precarious, uh, particularly politically? Um, is it dependent on policies of the, the government in place that might be jeopardized in future elections uh, nationally and, and also at the regional level with provincial governors? Possibly, but, you know, these are, these are powerful financial incentives uh, for Indonesia and any other country that wants to benefit from these programs. So, so there's that. And I think also the fact that Luhut himself is involved in this in a very serious way kind of, first of all, shows the seriousness of purpose in, in the government, but also kind of sends a message to the rest of the government and to the provinces and the governors and so forth that, that, uh, that they need to take these these opportunities seriously and and take advantage of of, of these kinds of programs like uh, like LEAF. So, you know, there's always going to be problems with corruption. There's always going to be problems with you know smallholders lighting fires and things like that. But if there's the, the will on the part of the the central government, the provincial governments to to, to fight those things, I, I and which I think there is now. Uh, because we've seen that in, in these last four years, there's an opportunity now for for some serious progress. Yeah, you mentioned in your editorial that Indonesia um, uh, differs from uh, Brazil and uh, the Congo in particular. Absolutely, I mean Brazil, as you know, has really been a disastrous story this year and and last as well. So it does contrast very favorably, and you know Indonesia. Um, they're going to be the G20 chair next year, and then they're going to be the ASEAN chair the year after that. So they've they've already said that they're going to make climate one of their one of the poles of their um, priorities, which I think is is really important and great. So so they have kind of on the hook now themselves to to show some leadership on this issue. Well, I was I was just wanted to go back to um, the 2015 fires, and you you can really sort of draw a line. From that event to to some of the regulatory changes and the big reforms um, aimed at preventing that, I, I was wondering if you could just give us a little bit of color about of, from where you stood and when, in your dialogue with with um, the with, with the Indonesian government. Just how much of an impact did that make? That must have been the, the the blowback from the international community must have been immense. It was. Um, you know, there, as I say, there was there were many, many articles in the press about this statistic that uh, of the emissions that were being released from these fires was the equivalent of, of what Germany was putting out in an entire year. So that I think was a, a, a kind of embarrassing for the, for the Indonesian that I'm not even sure they really understood it at that point. What a what a massive uh, scale they were dealing with. Um but you know they had they had some some powerful incentives here. Their neighbors, the, the the Malaysians and the Singaporeans, were were very upset about this. So this was becoming an inter ASEAN issue. And don't forget, the 2015 was also the year that Jokowi went to uh, to the White House to see Obama. So um, and oh, we had signaled to them in, in the run up, you know, we you, for a big visit like that, you start working on the so called deliverables about six months ahead of time. And so we had signaled to the Indonesians that the, that the fire issue was going to be a very important part of the conversation and that we were prepared to, to do what we can, you know, both through uh, working with groups like WRI, uh, Global Forest Watch, but also um, 
extending uh, technical support through the, through the U.S. Forest Service. I mean, after all, we in the United States have our own huge fire issue every single year because of climate change. We see these fires that are now taking place in California and really most of the West. So we've developed some some pretty good experience uh, in the Forest Service and how to, first of all, detect those fires as early as possible and and think through how to how to combat them in more in a more serious way. Of course, in, in California, it's it's super difficult because they've had on top of all the other problems these droughts that just once once a fire starts, it's almost impossible to put them out until you get some rain of some sort because the the, the wind and, and the dry uh, the dryness just makes it a powder keg. Well, President Trump said you just go out there and rake the forest floor and then you're done. I mean, it's, it's, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it was the fault of the Californians, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> California's fault. Well, I, I, was, I also wanted to ask you, Ambassador, about, you know, you, you hear you know, uh, um, the commentary the that the Americans were – were in Paris. In fact, they started Paris, and they then they flounced out of Paris. They 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 struck up Kyoto, and then they flounced out of Kyoto. And so, you know, fool me once, fool me twice, all this sort of stuff. Um, and that you and um, John Kerry are going against this this headwind of wariness and suspicion. Or you know, you're here again, but you know the next guy is will will just flounce out again. Um, it, assuming it is a guy or, you know, the next administration ju- just might cancel what, what you've yeah. done. Is is that bearing out in your experience? Uh, how much should we be reading into that? Well, you know, of course, we can't make any predictions about the future, as Yogi Berra said. But um, mm. we, we uh, you know, I, again, I think of the many regrettable decisions President Trump made, I think w- withdrawing from the Paris Accord was one of the worst. And it really did set back the entire global effort because it kind of gave a pass to many of the climate doubters to kind of slow down their their own nationally determined contributions. And that's why, as now the countries get ready for for Glasgow, we're, the world is behind even meeting the Paris commitments, much less doing something more ambitious by 2030. So, so I I, I, th- I think it was really regrettable uh, what Trump did. That said. Uh, no one should doubt um, the importance that that Biden and his team attached to this. I mean, I think he's made it clear right from the start that climate was going to be one of his most important objectives. He's got a really terrific team in place. We've got John Kerry himself, who's passionate on the subject, but also deeply knowledgeable. And they've, you know, they've made it clear that every every we're going to lead by example. You know, that every single thing. Um, that we do is going to have a, a climate focus and that every single U.S. department has got to have a, a, a greenhouse gas emission reduction plan. So we're, we're doing everything we can in our own country, uh, but we're also uh, really taking a global leadership role again to push other countries to, to do the same and really try to, again, reach this, this goal of limiting um, climate increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade by by 2030, which is a, a, a very very tall task. So, but I think you know again, people have seen, including in Indonesia, um, the impact of climate change. So they're feeling it and they're witnessing it. And so I, I think that the, the the climate doubters are are in retreat uh, in most parts of the world now, and they people understand the impact this is going to have and. Certainly, if you live in Jakarta, you know the annual flooding that takes place and the fact that they now have to consider moving the capital to Kalimantan because of, of, of sea level rise. So, you know, it, Indonesia is going to be one of the countries most affected by climate change. And so I'm, I'm glad that they, they now understand that and that they are taking serious measures. You know, one of the key uh, so, um, of uh arenas in Indonesia is the uh, mangrove uh, ecosystems. And uh, about six months ago, uh, Luhut Panjaitan raised uh, the topic of uh, mangrove rehabilitation when he visited uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, but it seems like as if it's been a bit quiet since then. Uh, do you have, have you uh, noticed any? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I, I'd say, you know, uh, Ibu City announced a, a huge program 
to rehabilitate, I think it was 600,000 hectares of, of mangrove forests. Um, and uh, so they're, you know, they're, they're very focused on, on mangroves, not just as a mechanism for carbon capture, but also to prevent soil erosion, you know, to help with uh, fish and shellfish population. You know, mangroves have many, many different uh, advantages. And Indonesia's mangroves are, are some of the most incredible resources in the world. I had the privilege of visiting some of those in Papua. And so there, there's, a, there's a need to, to work on this. And, and, and I'm glad that they've recognized that and are, are taking concrete steps. And again, I think there's going to be financing available for, for them to do more. Okay. And uh, just for the purpose of being as wonky as possible in this uh, podcast, which is something we always mm, Absolutely. Um, yeah. You did mention the uh, one map policy in your uh, editorial, and I was uh, yeah. glad to see that because that's another thing that uh, gets insufficient attention. Right. Uh, well, the- you know, we've been uh, we've, we've been talking about one map now for, you know, almost 10 years. And, yeah. And now, finally, there's a real there is now a close to being a, a real one map. And therefore, you can begin to I mean, from my perspective, one of the important things is that you can now have a common database. And so, for example, one of, one of the problems with that Global Forest Watch had in my time was that um, they could detect fires in parts of Sumatra, but they often didn't have the maps to be able to determine where on whose land those fires were taking place and therefore point the finger for accountability. Now, that's no longer a problem. You're going to be able to, to detect that. And so there is, a again, sort of a, a mechanism of accountability that uh, will provide an incentive for, for companies and for governments to, to take action. Yeah, I know that in the uh, Suharto era, forest areas were given away as a form of patronage, and they used... Uh, uh, very, very poor maps with a uh, very low scale, and, and the area was drawn in a magic marker, a, a black felt tip pen, literally. And so when you're on the ground, the, the width of the black felt tip marker was about 10 kilometers of forest uh, you know, width. And so it created exactly. a, <laughs> a lot of uh, confusion about who owns uh, the, the forest uh, on the black line. But when you say that, Kevin, it really does sort of underscore a colossal change in mindset, hopefully among some anyway, that in, in Indonesia, um, among the ruling class, it, resources were to be exploited. And now there seems to be about um, conserving, but as almost like um, part of, you know, the <laughs> as a national treasure. Yeah, or it's an economic asset to use more efficiently and productively. Is that something you see too, Ambassador Blake, especially with uh, regional heads being directly elected now? Yeah, yeah, I think you do see more of that. Well, um, actually, the pandemic is the the obstructing economic recovery, and uh, Indonesia has been struggling to get uh, vaccinations done. Even though it's a leader, it's still uh, happening slowly. Do you anticipate any supplies of vaccines from the U.S.? Is that something that... uh, you might have any insights about? I don't expect things in the short term. Um, I think, you know, Indonesia has been good about talking to the Chinese and many other sources. So they, they have a, a decent supply. But I don't think that the United States is going to be in a position. As you know, we've, we've announced that we're prepared to provide um, our, our AstraZeneca supplies. But I think a lot of that is going to go to India because India is facing such a disastrous uh, situation right now you know, more than 4,000 deaths a day and, you know, 400,000 new cases a day. I mean, it's just a, an awful, awful situation. Um, so I, I don't expect that there's going to be much left over for, for any other country. But over time, you know, we're, the United States is making great progress in, in our own vaccination efforts. So, so I think we will see more of these uh, vaccines become available. Uh, and we're also seeing that, uh, you know, Frankly, the, the pace of vaccinations is slowing down a little bit in the United States. The demand from the states is, with just this week, there were some several stories about how uh, several big states were only ha- requesting about 10% of their allocation and giving the rest of it back. So, so that means that the, that the supply available to the government is probably going to increase, and therefore they'll be in a, hopefully a better position to start uh, offering some of these to, to foreign countries. But to my knowledge, they haven't yet 
started to think through what how that's going to work and whether they would make that available directly or through COVAX or or what. Ambassador, you're, you're probably aware that uh, Indonesia has a brand new omnibus labor reform bill that yeah. um, simplifies um, investment um, and um, sort of you know, regulates a little more wages. Um, how has that been viewed in, in the States and can we expect uh, any, any sort of dividends from it? Yeah. You know, I think people here are, are aware of that. I mean, I think um, the, the government, but also groups like the U.S. ASEAN Business Council are doing a very good job of, of explaining how this really is quite an important uh, step that they're taking, that and, and, you know, the reform of the negative list, for example. So, you know, we're seeing that um, opportunities are opening up in areas like ma- uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, hospitals. Uh, for me, uh, th- that is just hugely important. Education is another one. Um, I was really happy to see that the first foreign university, uh, Monash University in Australia, is going to be allowed to open a campus. And so I'm one of my goals now this year is to try to see if I can get an American campus to come mm. and, and open because in Ind- Indonesia really needs that. You know, yes, um, they're they're taking a lot of steps to improve the business climate. But um, there's still one, one of the big issues still is finding trained labor in, in, in Indonesia. So I think if you could help them to to uh, get the kind of training that they really need in this in the new economy. I mean, I, they've, they've got plenty of decent universities, but hardly any prestigious universities offer courses in the digital economy, in e-commerce, in cybersecurity, in uh, you know, data management, all, you know, all of those things that are really going to be critical to the future of the digital economy in Indonesia. Uh, so and so Amer- American and other foreign universities are very w- well placed to provide that. And now I'm, I'm happy that they're that the government's wel- welcoming that. And likewise, on the hospital side, you know, for, for many years, we've all been knocking our heads against the wall to try to encourage the Indonesian government to allow foreign hospitals to come in. And as you know, the, the very powerful doctors association in Indonesia successfully blocked that. But as a result, Indonesia has been hemorrhaging billions of dollars a year in service exports as Indonesians go to Singapore and Thailand and, and the United States to get the healthcare that they, a lot of which they could probably get in Indonesia if they had decent care. So the government's finally recognize that and they are allowing um, hospitals to come in now. So I think, you know, once the pandemic really begins to ease and the Indonesians allow people, businesses to come in in a more, you know, routine way, um, I think you're going to see interest on the part of big uh, uh, foreign uh, university, sorry, foreign hospital groups uh, to, to examine opportunities. And the um, in, influx of investment from China, um, in your mind, is uh, net positive or negative or pros and cons? You know, it, it, it's it's mixed. Uh, and obviously, Indonesia welcomes uh, the investment that's taken place. And China is both their largest investor, but also their largest trading partner, as is, it is for almost every country in the Asia Pacific these days. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I think, People are are a little bit wary sometimes of of the relations with China. You know, they they worry about China's growing military assertiveness in the South China Sea. They chafe a little bit at the what they call the wolf warrior diplomacy. You know, the the Chinese diplomats now who kind of throw their weight around a little bit too much. People object to the Chinese requirements for allowing Chinese workers to come into these to these. Uh, to these various projects. And I think an interesting new uh, thing that I've been tracking is how a lot of the sort of what, you know, sort of digital, digitally connected young people, not only in Indonesia, but in places like Myanmar and Thailand, are, are really more and more worried about democratic trends in Southeast Asia and often see that China is really propping up a lot of these authoritarian regimes. So you see a real backlash by, you know, the Gen Zers and millennials um, against China. And you actually saw them trying to attack factories in Myanmar, for example, Chinese owned factories. So 
So there, you know, there, China is having to kind of face the music a little bit in, in some of these countries now, which is good because they have been trying to promote their own kind of authoritarian brand of governance. And I think that's to people's disadvantage. Um, you know, the other area that I worry a little bit about is, is, is corruption. You know, I think corruption has often been a, a problem in Indonesia and, um, you know, a lot of the, the transactions that take place through the Belt and Road Initiative are are very difficult to, to really understand. There's very little transparency about the terms, uh, you know, what, what, how many foreign workers are being allowed or a, any of that stuff. And so it's all a little bit of a black hole. And so and then there's always the concern that the state owned enterprise, the state owned enterprise transactions might have some you know, uh, provisions in them that allow for payments to officials on both sides. So, so that I think undercuts efforts to, to promote transparency and accountability and, you know, anti-corruption efforts. Um, the U S uh, tariffs on, on a lot of Chinese goods is, um, put a lot of, um, attention or driven some investment out of China or caused, cause companies to diversify some of their supply chain out of, out of China. Yeah. Uh, to Vietnam, to Thailand, and of course, Indonesia. So a lot sort of rests, a lot, a lot of investment decisions rest on those tariffs. Do you see those sticking around under the Biden administration? I do. I don't, I don't, well, I, not, maybe not the whole administration, but <clears throat> as you know, um, Biden has said right from the start that he's going to take it slow on, on, uh, on trade uh, and, and not make any big decisions until you know, he, he wants first to, to kind of get our own house in order, uh, which I think is the right thing to do. And so he's he said right up front, you know, he wants to get our improve our infrastructure. Of course, he wants to improve our own economic picture. He wants to restore the, uh, the our uh, the um, our our research and development programs. Uh, and then only then will they begin to think about, for example, new trade deals and things like that. And I think for the moment, as you say, he hasn't he's just he's kept a lot of these Chinese programs in place until they can sort out some of these other more more urgent priorities like the infrastructure bill that uh, is now under discussion in Washington. And I, and I think that's the right thing to do. Um, and certainly, as you say, the, the Southeast Asian countries have been beneficiaries of that. I mean, I think it's one shouldn't for, for those who are listening. Companies are not going to leave China. China is too big a, no, a, a no. market and too important a market. What they're really doing is these companies are doing is just increasing their resilience so that they're not totally dependent on China. Right. And so they might think about having another factory in Vietnam or, as you say, Thailand or Indonesia. For the most part, I think it, Vietnam has been the key beneficiary of that so far. But but I do think that that there are opportunities now more and more in Indonesia as as they again improve the ease of doing business and as they uh, as Indonesia's own infrastructure program continue, continues and and helps to reduce logistics costs. I've been telling American companies that I do think that there are opportunities, for example, in Central Java, where there are green opportunities. You've got a lot of trained labor and the cost of labor is about half there of what it would be around Jakarta. Uh, and so, you know, and, and again, the infrastructure is pretty good in places like Semarang. So uh, so I, I do think that there are opportunities and, and I've you know shared that with American companies. But again, just for the moment, people are a little bit wary about traveling to Indonesia as this, until the COVID is really over with. But but I do think we're going to see more interest on the part of American companies. And part of that is on because of this energy opportunity. One more question, Kevin? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I think. Uh... Can I just say one, one more thing, guys, just to, again, because yes. I uh, may be a little bit counterintuitive, um, which is that, uh, on the whole, I, I am encouraged about some of the things that are now happening uh, in Indonesia that I'm not sure really get that much attention in the United States. I mean, everybody knows about the growth of the digital economy. And of course, Indonesia has the, the, the largest and the fastest growing. But what they don't know, I think, which is quite interesting, is that uh, a lot of these big unicorns like Tokopedia and, and Bukalapak and, and Gojek, 
you know, they're now uh, they're now expanding their range of services. So they're not just e-commerce companies anymore, but they're offering digital payments and they've got healthcare and they've got hotel bookings and you can get, you know, you can get your uh, Netflix on, on, on there. You can even invest in, on some of their platforms. And I was talking to um, a friend at Tokopedia the other day, and he told me a really interesting thing that Tokopedia now has 10 million merchants on their platform, uh, which is an e-commerce platform. 86% of them are first time entrepreneurs, which is really kind of amazing when you think about it. And I asked him about the sort of geographical reach, because of course, we've all had a long interest in trying to help Indonesia diversify investment out of Java. And he said now that the, these merchants are, are in, in basically 99% of the districts of, uh, of, of Indonesia. So you're seeing a much greater uh, reach. And I think you're going to see, again, sort of these, these small and medium-sized enterprises are, are starting to sprout up all over the world. And these big companies have figured out the logistics of all this. And so, and I think there, there's, a, there's a huge room to grow. They, they say that only about, uh, there are 60 million or so uh, medium, micro and small and medium-sized en uh, enterprises in Indonesia. Only about 10% of them right now are connected into some platform like Bukalapak. So there's a, there's a real opportunity to do much more there. And then the other thing that I think doesn't get a lot of attention is that Silicon Valley and, and China, Chinese investors have discovered startups in Indonesia. And a friend of mine who, who is a VC, a you know, venture capitalist in Indonesia, told me the other day that the number of startups with an equity market valuation of $25 million or more has been increasing rapidly. So it's, in 2016, it was 16. In 2018, it was 30. And then 2020, it was 54. So basically doubling every two years. And they expect that to continue. Uh, and that a lot of those $25 million companies, of course, that's just the Series A financing. You know, they're, they're then going to go on to Series B, Series C, and so forth. So, so they're, these, a lot of people in Silicon Valley are actually quite bullish now about opportunities. And, and, I, and I think that's right. And then, you know, of course, you're seeing these big manufacturing that's taking place now, the stainless steel in, in, uh, in South Sulawesi, the possibility now of, of EV electric vehicle batteries that, this, that the South Koreans and others are talking about. So I, I do have a sort of sense that things are, are moving and that the super tanker that is the Indonesian economy is sort of slowly turning in a more positive direction. And, I mean, and I'm it's just coming up against the, uh, the, the unseen coral reef of the 2024 election. <laughs> Possibly. He <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> just took the air out of that bloom. But I, Ambassador, I completely agree with you. You were saying that uh, you needed to to leave uh, right yeah. about now. Is oh, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, hopefully, we've we've been able to cover a lot of the ground you needed to cover. We can have another conversation if you're if there's other stuff you need me to talk about. Good. What are you doing next week? Yeah, <laughs> they got a show next week. <laughs> but you, you, you sound like someone who um, wants to come back. I do. I do. I, you know, I, I, I love my time in Indonesia. I still have a lot of friends and, you know, I do a lot of business now on, on, on the private side. So I do think there's plenty of opportunities for uh, American companies to do more business here uh, in, in Indonesia. And I'm, I'm happy to. I'm looking forward to when I can come back now because it's been almost a year and a half since I visited Indonesia because of the COVID problems. But but I'm hoping in the next couple of months that that's going to change and I'll be able to get back there. So well, you are officially a friend of the pod. So we'll send you a card and you can just flash that to get into the building um, <laughs> uh, when we get Great. one. Uh, it uh, entitles you to a 15% off uh, at Jayco. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, we're working on some of those <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much for your help. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ambassador. Okay, guys, great to talk to you. Thank All you, right. sir. Talk, talk to you soon. soon. That's our program. Thanks to former Ambassador Robert Blake. As always, our producer is Stephen Handoko, editing by Aditya Akbar. Our music is by the Blue Dot Sessions. 
If you like this podcast, please hit subscribe and rate us. It helps. Hell, even if you don't like us, please subscribe. You can sign up to Kevin's Reformasi weekly newsletter at reformasi.info. This podcast is a production of On The Level Media. I'm Jeff Hutton. Bye for now. Thank you.